Hello and welcome to the Healthy Home Show. We're right here at BevCam in Beverly, Massachusetts. I'm Richard Mullen, also known as the Mole Guy, and I'm your host for this series. Each week we're going to examine a different component of your home or a different service that can help you to keep your air clean and to have a healthy home. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at what happens during a mold inspection, what you can expect, why people have mold inspections, and the result of it, and how you can use it for the future to stay healthy, keep your house dry, and keep your moisture down. Now, I'm the owner of Pure Air Pro, and I'm also an indoor air quality specialist. I'm a certified mold inspector and roof inspector. And, and just for a signal before I forget, I want to tell you, next week we have a great guest coming from uh, the Green Cocoon Insulation Company. Uh, and uh, Candace will be here, and she'll be giving us a pretty good background on what you can do for your home so that you can get some uh, insulation, know more about it, and what's the right way to go. All right, so let's do this. I want to tell you why most people call me or I meet people in a mold inspection. And primarily, what's happening is that a homeowner has one of four reasons to do, probably call. One, they've observed some mold growth or what appears to be something that they don't like going on in their basement or some, some area of their house where there's a lot of moisture. And the other thing they often get is that musty odor. So I don't know if you're familiar with that musty odor. Hopefully you're not. But if you are, that's coming from mold in the development stage. Mold is growing, and it's sending out an odor, and it's kind of a, um, an off gas, as they call it. And so you'll smell that musty odor. And it's in older homes, especially with all the older homes we have around here, uh, you'll find that many of the homes have that musty odor in the basement because a number of reasons. One is they're unfinished basements. Uh, some have still have um, dirt or sand floors. Uh, some have brick floors where there's uh, moisture escaping from the bricks. And some of us have, you know, granite homes where they are uh, built on a ledge. And that also will produce mold. So that's one of the reasons we get a call. The other reason is because somebody in the household has sensitivity um, and is showing signs of mold, uh, what a mold can do to you. And, and one of the things is people, younger people are getting asthma earlier. And so when that happens, people want to at least examine what can they do uh, to solve the problem. And that's the other reason people call. Uh, the third reason usually is somebody's buying or selling a house. And they want to be sure that they're where they stand with mold. Is there mold? If there is mold, is it going to be expensive to take it out? If they're going to sell the house, should they have a remediator come in first? So it's always good to get an inspection. At least you know what's going on. And uh, you're ahead of the game instead of waiting till just before you're going to sign papers and someone talks about mold. So you stay educated and you stay a little bit ahead of the curve. And... The other thing that happens so often, and most of my calls are from <clears throat> people who have gone on vacation, especially this month, February. We're in February doing this program. They'll go away for a week or two, go up north skiing or go down south, and they come home, and something's happened in the house. They either had a flood or their water heater burst or a pipe burst, and there's water everywhere, and they walk into what looks like a prehistoric jungle of mold hanging everywhere. And it's pretty scary at first. And it's, uh, so that's one of the main reasons we get calls to. And I think finally the, the typical call is um, when it really rains out really hard. Like we got, we got a lot of weather and uh, tough weather. And so that's gonna create mold. And this month, February and into March is mold month. More mold reports in, in February than in, and then in August. Those two months are the, the busiest months for this. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So that's why you would get a mold inspection. And what's going to happen when you get a mold inspection? So when somebody calls me, 
the first thing I do is I will talk to them on the phone before I come out. <clears throat> um, and the reason is I want to find out, A, is, is there a reason to come out? Is it uh, necessary? And so I'll ask them a series of questions and where they've seen the mold and where it is and, um, and can they send me a picture of it? <clears throat> and usually while I'm talking to them, I'll go into Google Maps and I'll take a look at their house uh, so they get an idea of what the grounds look like outside. Is there a lot of trees around there? Can I see what the roof looks like? Is there uh, a water source around there? And so I'm looking for any type of thing that I can see, and then I usually take street level and go around the house and see what I can see. So when I'm having that conversation, I can give them at least a, um, an educated uh, guess as to whether we should do a, a mold inspection or not. <clears throat> And if we decide to do a mold inspection, I'll come out. And I have a 60-point mold inspection I do. The 60 areas of the house that I check. And that's for a complete mold inspection. And we'll talk a little about that later. So I, I go around the house, and I'm, what I'm looking for is I'm looking up at the gutters, I'm looking at the roof. And if I can see certain things, then I know there's going to be mold inside. One of them is, if I go around to the bulkhead and I see that the bulkhead is all kind of rotting away because of um, water and ice, and there's still water and ice around the bulkhead, and so I know water's getting into the basement. So when I go inside, I'm going to be looking in that area. I also look for any kind of venting. So I see venting, so I know there's going to be a wash machine there, what else is going to be there, and I want to go looking for that. So after I take a trip around the house, I've got a pretty good idea what I want to look at inside. And generally when I go in, <clears throat> I'll talk to the homeowners, and it's really great if one or both of the homeowners can go on the tour with me as I go through the 60 steps. And I start down in the basement because that's usually the place where uh, most of our mold is growing. We'll go around and look at the laundry, if the laundry is downstairs. Is it a finished? Is it unfinished? And that's the information I want to get. If it's a finished mold um, basement, does it have carpeting on it? Because usually, in general, if there's carpeting on a floor in a basement, there's a high percentage chance there's going to be mold growing underneath it. So I, it, it's kind of, I know it, it, it's painful to tell people when I go and I see a nice, well-done burba carpet, and you can tell it's like a uh, just done really great big TV and everything, and I tell them that they really should not have a carpet in a basement. So if you can just kind of take that as a note, and if you're going to do anything and finish your basement off, it's better to do a laminated floor, wood floor, and then put a rug over it. Uh, that's the best way to go. So as I look around, I'm looking for... Um, Anything that I can see, I want to see mold. If there's a drop ceiling, I want to take a little look up inside if I can, if, it's, if there's easy access to it. Now, as a mold inspector, I'm not supposed to remove anything or to do anything that uh, uncover anything. I'm just supposed to observe what I can see when I go in. And what we do, we call that the, um, the look and see test, or the, the look and smell test. So I look and I smell. Do I smell musty odors? Can I see mold? What is apparent mold growth? So those are the two things I'm looking for. In the unfinished part of the basement, especially some of our older homes, um, you know, going from Cape Ann and, and down into Salem and uh, on the water, we're going to find uh, mold, historic mold, which is mold marking. It might not be growing now. It might have uh, dried up and the water source was taken care of. But we'll see some of it, and it's typical. And the good part is the older the home is, the denser the wood is it's built with, so it's going to be harder for mold to take root. So some of the older homes will have mold staining, but if we see active mold, then that's when we want to start addressing that. That's what we're going to we'll talk about as we go through the house. The next place we're going to go is after the basement, I'm going to look at the, the basement doors, the access, whether it's a bulkhead or just a shed uh, entry. And I want to look at the stairs inside and the door frame right around it. And do I see mold growth? Do I see rotting wood? 
uh, from water. And that's going to give me an indication of that mold is being, moisture is coming in from the outside and it's coming into the basement. So that, that helps me to understand what's going on in the house. Other thing I'm looking at is, is there an open sump pump? So a lot of times the older houses will have sump pumps, one or two, some of them, and they're not in use. So people say to me, I don't know, I've never, I don't even know if it works. But in it is some standing water. So that standing water is moisture to feed mold. So that's one of the things we mark down. We want to make some recommendations on how to take care of that. The next place I always look is at the water heater. How old is it? A lot of times the, uh, when a plumber puts it in, they'll put the date on, which is really helpful. If you can get the date that's in. So if it's a 10-year-old water heater, you want to start thinking about getting a new water heater. So what I'm looking for is any leaking. Um, is there any rust? Is there any standing water around that so that the, the uh, base of the water heater might be leaking? And all of that is going to feed mold. And so that's what we're looking for. <clears throat> now, a lot of people have their laundry in the basement. And it's usually in the unfinished side of the basement. And is it vented properly? I usually open the washing machine. And sometimes I can actually see mold growth around there. Because the mold isn't growing on the, <clears throat> the metal machine. But it's growing on the dust and the dirt associated with that. And so I, as I go through the house, I can tell, is there leaking from above where the kitchen sink is, where the bathroom is? Is there water coming down? And that's going to feed mold. And the other thing I do while I'm there, <clears throat> I usually set up one of these, which is a moisture meter. And I've got a better picture on that we'll put on. Um, but it tells you what the percentage of relative humidity is. And so here in the studio, it's very low. It's 19. So the chance of mold showing up in the BevCam is very low. <clears throat> so this is a great little piece of equipment to have in your house. And I say they're, I think they're 10 or $11 right now. And put one in the basement, the first floor, second floor, wherever there's a living, somebody's living. And if you have an unfinished attic, put one up there. It's inexpensive, but every once in a while you can go up and check it. You can see if your humidity is going up. If this is high, if this gets up above 60% relative humidity, you're going to have mold growing. So here's, I'm, I'm checking, this is 19, so this is great. <clears throat> a little dry, but it's better than having a lot of humidity. So these are things you can set in, and, and that's what I'm doing as I go around. I'm reading relative humidity. I'm setting this down while I'm in that thing. I'll take it, and then I'll make a note of what the relative humidity is. The other thing I do, I have another <clears throat> piece of equipment with me, which this is a, a moisture meter. And what this does, if I put this up against the wall, it will read right here on the screen how much moisture is on it. And uh, I can't really see it here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another picture with it in this here so you can actually see it, what it does. There are some that have prongs that you stick in the wall. I don't use them because I don't want to go to someone's house and stick two holes in their wall, and uh, <clears throat> I just don't do it. This here is fine, but it tells you whether you have wet walls, moisture. You know, is it over 13 to 18 percent? Once it gets over 18 percent, that's water. Someplace in there, and you want to deal with it. And there's also some tricks to this to understand how this works a little better. If you put it towards a beam in the back, there's a, a metal beam, for example, on nails. It'll read 100%, so you think you have water. But you have to do is just move it over a little bit, and you'll see it drop down. And it should be reading between 0 and 15%, ideally, because there's moisture everywhere in wood. It depends how old your house is at the same time. So those are a couple of things. Another thing we can do... <clears throat> And I can only do that with the homeowner's uh, approval. If the homeowner puts a little hole in their wall, <clears throat> just about enough to put this screen in, this probe in, I have a, this is a little camera, and it'll show up on this screen. And I can tell what's behind it on this here by looking at this screen. And uh, see if I can get that on a little bit. 
But if I stick that in, it's just like a, a little x-ray machine or something, but you can see what's, what's behind the wall, and it can tell you whether there's any mold growth. Um, and then I always tell people, before, when you're done, make sure that you turn it off <clears throat> and that you, you take and you, you block that hole up because if there is mold growth, you don't want it, the mold to start coming out. Right now it's contained in the wall. Eventually, if mold is moisture in, behind the wall, it's going to come through the wall at some time. So we want to take a look at that and find out what we can do. So those are the three things. And of course, I always tell people, have a little flashlight with you so you can look for mold, especially in corners. Those are some simple things. And if you, um, I have some material on that for on my website. Uh, if you want to go to that, you can, it's kind of like a learning thing. It's more of an educational, informational site. Um, so that's it. So those are some of the things we're looking for in the basement. And the next place we go, if we have access to it, <clears throat> is to look into the attic. Now, if it's an unfinished attic and there's, it's, there's no board, it's just, you know, maybe some insulation, but there's no uh, walk space on there, the only thing we really can do is take and, and pop our head in and look around and see what we can see on the sheathing on the inside. Is there any staining? Is there any staining right above where the moisture comes up? from the house, and so we're looking for that. And we want to see is how much insulation is in the house. We want to look over and see if somebody's taken and um, maybe taken the uh, bathroom vent fan and just put that vent hose and thrown it into the attic and didn't, didn't vent it out outside of the house. And I find that very frequently, that somebody puts a vent in and then they just leave it in the attic and um, somebody, uh, told me they thought it was better to warm the attic. It would help, but that's gonna create mold, any type of moisture, anything like that is mold. So through the attic, we wanna look, and the thing I look for is, are they using the attic for storage? So some people will take and they'll put plywood on the floor, and if they have blown in insulation, what they'll do is they'll crush down the blown in insulation, which takes away from the R value, and then they'll put Christmas, the old Christmas tree stuff and the, put boxes, <clears throat> old carpets and things that they might not want to throw away quite yet. So here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to have storage, cardboard storage in the attic because eventually it's going to catch up with you. Uh, it's going to produce mold. There's going to be moisture coming through the attic seasonally and then you're going to be in you're going to have some difficulty there. So you want to start shifting your cardboard boxes and shift them from cardboard to plastic containers and keep them sealed. And ideally, um, not to compress, if, if you can, not to compress that uh, insulation that's in there if you have blown in insulation. So those are the things we're looking for in the attic. I'm also looking is the ventilation, if you have soffit vents, are they blocked at the soffits so that the air can go up along the roof and go out into the vent, um, the ridge vent? And some roofs have that. And, you know, many roofs do have that in this area. It's the best way to do it. Um, there's another system now. And, and next week when we have our insulation expert in, we'll, we'll talk about the other system. And that way it gives people access. One of the things I like to talk about is the if you have knee walls. So people have gone up into their attic, put knee walls in, and finished the attic so they can have a spare room. Uh, just don't go up and do that. Get a little bit of advice on how you're going to vent that area out, and you know where the, where the heat and the cold is coming. You know whether you're going to have an open space, a cold space on the other side of the wall. Are you going to do the whole the whole attic, and you're going to insulate the whole attic? because most people with knee walls eventually will have a problem with um, moisture. So those are some of the things that uh, we're, we're gonna see in the attic. Uh, if I notice when I go up, if you have pull down stairs, and this is especially for split levels, usually the, the, split, the pull down stairs are in the hallway, right next to the bathroom. So if you've got a family of say four or six people and they're all using that particular shower what you do is you have moisture coming up all the time 
into the attic. So that's going to create enough moisture to grow mold. And it's going to get on you, onto the, uh, the roofing members, onto the sheathing. It's going to get onto the floor. And eventually it's going to come back down into your house. And that's where people start getting sensitivity <clears throat> as mold spores move around and they start to grow inside. So that's the uh, now next thing I do, I'll go through the house and I'll look at the bathroom fans and the kitchen fans. And I test them with just a little kind of a square of tissue paper or toilet paper and put it up to that fan and see if it holds it. <clears throat> if that paper drops, then that's not adequate. You need more ventilation in your bathroom. And what that means is you're going to always have condensation on your uh, mirrors. It's going to be on your walls, and you're going to have mold growth. So those are the things we're always looking for and looking at. One of the things they say in the um, is that it should actually hold, that fan should hold a business card up and doesn't drop off. So that knows you've given enough ventilation and you have enough pressure pulling to get all of the uh, condensation out of the bathroom. And same with the kitchen. So those are two things. And then I just want to look around at the windows and I want to see if there's any condensation or is there any um, mold staining or water staining around the windows, which would mean indicate condensation um, coming in and blocking off. Uh. So those are the things in the house. Um, the big thing I, when I'm outside and I see it happen so often is damaged gutters, gutters that are leaking water, um, also the downspouts are directed right into the, into the foundation, and that means that water is getting into the foundation where your floor meets your, uh, your wall, your foundation wall. And eventually that's just going to be all damage. So what we want to do is always get people to start diverting those and push them away from the house, how's the slope of the land, walk around, see if after a big rainstorm, if you see any um, standing water in corners. That is, uh, so there's, there's a low, it's starting to wash out and make a nice little puddle, and that's right in a corner where your foundation is. And what will happen there is that it'll just get worse and worse. It doesn't get better, but you're gonna have more water, so you really have to divert that. You probably have to put some stones in there just to get rid of that little that area where mold where water can go because once your foundation gets really wet it's going to go in from the outside in and it's going to just be continuous moisture for um, mold growth and the other thing i see often is people with uh, window wells window wells are nice for the basement because they can bring some light in uh, into the basement and the problem is if you don't maintain those and you get them filled with leaves, they're not going to be able to drain out. And what they do is they fill up, and before you know it, they're going over into your window and flooding into your basement, and then you have a, a mold emergency. So you want to look at all of your, your exterior, things like that, and clean them out. And the same with your, um, your gutters. If you can, and you have access to them, try to get them cleaned out at least once a year. And if you start to see trees growing in your, uh, a lot of times you go by someone's house and they have a, a small tree growing in their gutter, you know, it's time to get up there and clean it out. Or hire somebody to get it cleaned out. So those are some of the things on, on the inside, outside. <clears throat> now the next thing is, is the family. It's really easy to get used to um, mold in the house. And I've been to houses with its mold stain throughout the house and people have just got <clears throat> comfortable with it over the years. And they say, oh, it's only mold. We'll clean it up every once in a while. <clears throat> but when you see mold in your house growing, that's pretty serious because that's also getting into your lungs and it's getting in, in, into your nose and it's getting onto your body. Now, there are people who are so sensitive to mold that it's kind of like a peanut allergy. They have an immediate reaction to it. And uh, it, it can be very serious for those people. One of the problems is there's a lot of people like that. <clears throat> and they live in a family where nobody else in the family 
is allergic to mold. And they're the only ones that are. And I've talked to a number of people who say eventually they start to think they're crazy because, you know, the whole family is saying there's nothing wrong. Uh, everything's fine. But they're that small percentage of people that have mold allergies. And I always tell if they know someone like that, give me a call because I can at least steer them in a direction where they don't feel they're alone and they're just crazy. Uh, that it is a true allergy and it can be very serious. Um, it can knock you out. <clears throat> the other thing we want to mention before I go is that uh, if you have an in-the-wall air conditioner, and that was very common, you know, in the 60s and 70s and uh, even into the 80s, putting in-the-wall air conditioners, a lot of them are never changed, never taken out, never cleaned, and they become just so loaded with mold and that the mold is so old there, the mold gets stronger and stronger. And I know of several cases where people eventually got so, it was affecting them so much because they had an indoor wall right over their bed. They couldn't get up, dizzy, couldn't walk, um, had a, a bunch of symptoms. It just made them feel as though they were an invalid and they never thought of the air conditioner. And I went in, I think the first time I, I talked to somebody who was really, sick with that, very sick. I said, I'll tell you what, if you remove that, I think you'd get better. And three weeks later, they called me, they said they got rid of the indoor, um, in the wall air conditioner, and the, uh, the, the person that was being affected was feeling 100% better. And actually, for a while, he couldn't go to work, but he started going back to work. So those are the types of things we're dealing with. And that's what I want to do in a mold inspection. It's very simple. Um, I always tell people that when I do it, feel free to call me at any time. If you've got a question, call me. I don't mind. If I, I'd rather give you an answer than have you somebody in the house get sick. If you've got elderly living in the house, uh, infants, those are the people you really want to protect because they're in the house most of the time, and they're going to be affected by it. So that's a, a quick survey of what we can expect in a mold inspection and I think next week I mentioned that we're going to have um, somebody from the Green Cocoon here, which is a, uh, a great insulation company, and Candace, who is, she's actually one of the very st strongest professionals in the area, and she actually teaches um, about indoor air quality using uh, insulation. So I'm Richard Mullen. I thank you again. See you later. Thanks, Bev Cam, for the time. <laughs>